Dear people of God, welcome home. How good, Lord, to be here. As we gather around this font on March 1st, 2020, this is where I began my public relationship with you. And uh, so, it is very appropriate that we are here. I want to thank the many members who have spruced up the church and uh, cordoned off the pews, etc. Quite a crew was in this week to get all of this ready that we might assemble in Jesus' name. Just a word of instruction, just to reiterate what's uh, written in the bulletin uh, for communion. Uh, it'll be one uh, line, continuous uh, standing, starting with this side, the front to the back. Uh, I will stand uh, uh, in the center, the palms up, please. I'll drop the bread in your hand. Then you move this way, if you're on this side, uh, to receive uh, the communion uh, wine. Uh, and then return by the side aisles. When this side is fully communed, we'll do this side, and it should be orderly. We'll work out the uh, details, uh, but just to get this word of instruction out of the way as the Holy Spirit gathers us in. And please know we also have a new hymnal. Uh, All Creation Sings is the purplish book, uh, and two of our hymns, including the first one, uh, come from that book. Let us sing as God gathers us in Jesus' name. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. 
God of the covenant, in our baptism you call us to proclaim the coming of your reign. Give us the courage you gave the apostles that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Ezekiel. A voice said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet, and I will speak with you. And when the Lord spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard the Lord speaking to me, saying, Mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. Word of God, word of life. A reading from 2 Corinthians. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know, such, I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But, I wish, but if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, 
My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel, according to Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And Jesus could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then Jesus went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not not to put on two tunics. Jesus said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you. As you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. that Independence Day falls on a Sunday gives us occasion to think about the meaning of this day, with special attention perhaps to the nature of power in our nation these days. Alas, for many today it seems that the theme of independence can be reduced to a rugged individualism that I, as a lone individual, am independent from anybody else and can press my advantage and exercise my own power over any and all others at will. Moreover, as we reflect on the state of our nation and that of other nations in the world, we see, of course, a rise in a kind of populism that seems to prefer leaders to be radical, individualist, strong men and they are almost always men, who exercise power by sheer force. Today is a national holiday, but it's also Sunday, the Lord's Day, the day of assembly for God's people. And thanks be to God that we are doing it in person, indoors, in our more usual ways in our beloved church building. Amen indeed. You're welcome to talk back to this preacher, so. (laughs) Thus, we are beckoned also to turn our attention to the approach to power exhibited by Jesus as seen in today's readings, which bear witness to Christ and his ways. To be sure, 
there is generally a human tendency to attempt to create Jesus in our own image. And even some of Jesus' closest followers wanted him to be someone he wasn't, that is, a political revolutionary who would assume power in traditional human ways, namely by force. Some Christians in our own day call for a muscular Jesus who reflects the mores of our current sociopolitical culture more than the traits of a prince of peace. Hence the importance of looking at the scriptures closely and carefully to see what they in fact suggest about Jesus' approach to power. The story about Jesus' visit to his hometown and its synagogue is telling. Some of the hometown crowds took offense at Jesus' teaching. They were astounded that Jesus, son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and the sisters, was doing deeds of power in the first place. Where did this man get all of this, they asked. The result of this skepticism, as Mark reports, is that Jesus could do no deed of power there except he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Why was Jesus able to do few deeds of power in his hometown? In short, Jesus' power in relation to people is a power with people, not a power over people. Jesus' approach to power centers on cultivating trust, not coercion. Thus, the power of Jesus also relates to belief, to faith. Faith conceived as trust. Willingness is another important theme here related to trust. Or to put it in more familiar political terms of our day, Jesus' approach to power is one that rests on the consent of the governed. Jesus was amazed at their unbelief of those in his hometown. Unbelief might also be translated absence of faith, a lack of trust in Jesus. This unbelief inhibited what otherwise would have been the release of Jesus' power. We also see Jesus' approach to power reflected in today's reading from Mark in his instruction to the twelve whom he sent out two by two. If any place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Here, the power of the disciples doing deeds in Jesus' name is all about welcome, an approach to power again that is about the willingness of the other to receive the power and not to be coerced by others to receive it unwillingly. Furthermore, the Apostle Paul reveals much about the kind of Christly power followers of Jesus pursue when he concludes in today's reading from 2 Corinthians, which centers on a word he received from the Lord. My grace is sufficient for you, the Lord said to him, for power is made perfect in weakness. Paul continues in his own words, so I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ, for whenever I am weak, then I am strong. In short, in today's New Testament readings, we see nothing of so-called toxic masculinity in Christly approaches to power. Rather, it's all about the cross. It is centered on the cross, a symbol of weakness for those on the receiving end of crucifixion, but a sign of violent imperial power by those doing the crucify. But from a divine vantage point and perspective, the cross is all about the ultimate power of almighty, omnipotent God and the paradox that God is at God's most powerful, in fact, in the humiliation of execution by crucifixion. For on the cross, God turns the world's logic upside down by making the cross a tree of life for the healing and salvation of the world. Cruciform power confronts the world's laws and rules of concerning power with a power rooted in vulnerability and perceived weakness, a witness to the transgressive, rebellious, impudent, and stubborn, not unlike those spoken of in today's first reading from Ezekiel. 
Cruciform power is a witness that can turn stubborn hearts and minds into willing hearts and minds and result in faith and trust. Again, this paradoxical kind of sacred power embodied by Jesus on the tree of life of the cross involves intimately the willing trust of those who look to the cross for salvation. We apprehend the cross's wisdom by faith and by faith alone. The witness of the cross can generate faith in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we celebrate on Sunday, which happens to be Independence Day. All of this resonates deeply with the Lutheran emphasis on faith, on trust in Christ Jesus, sola fide, faith alone, along with grace alone, Christ alone, scripture alone, but faith releases the power of each, of grace, of Christ, of the scriptures. Sola fide, faith alone. This faith-oriented, faith-centered, faith-derived power is exemplified also in our Christian life together, our sacramental practices. Think about Lutheran understandings of the efficacy of baptism. Luther writes in the small catechism, how can water do such great things? Clearly the water does not do it, but the word of God, which is with and alongside the water, and faith, which trusts this word of God with water. Word, water, faith, work together and release the power of the Holy Spirit to do the great things in the sacrament in making us children of God. Likewise, the efficacy of the sacrament of the altar. Again, Luther writes in the small catechism, who then receives the sacrament worthily? Fasting and bodily preparation are in fact fine external discipline, but a person who has faith in these words, given for you and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin is really worthy and well prepared. However, a person who does not believe these words or doubts them is unworthy and unprepared because the words for you require truly believing hearts. Here again, faith is part of the dynamic of Christ being made known to us in the breaking of the bread. In short, sacramental power involves the dimension of faith, of trust, of the willingness of those partaking consistent with the scriptural witness about Jesus' approach to power on this day of return to our usual place of assembly in this building. It's important to state again the basics of our life together lest we have forgotten in these 16 months. Again, the power of Christ enacted in this earthly ministry and the power of Christ evident in our life together contrasts so sharply with ordinary notions of power, especially today when our world is bathed in the violence of coercive power of one sort or another. Here's a concluding observation. The faith-focused power of Jesus made perfect in weakness has been operative, I believe, in our whole approach as a congregation to the pandemic. The fact that we are only now returning to worshiping in person indoors. For the sake of neighbor love, in protecting those most vulnerable among us in the congregation and the wider community, We have refrained from exercising our individual and independent power and freedom to assemble in person indoors. Indeed, some Christian groups early in the pandemic asserted themselves to meet in person indoors as a demonstration of their powers for free religious assembly. Well, God's people, we are free too, and we are free to be for the neighbor. Indeed. In our congregation, we have offered a different witness to the world. And even now, we restrain some of our freedom, independence, and individual power by asking that we all continue to wear masks, and I'll put my mask on again when I get closer to you, and again, out of solidarity, solidarity with those not yet vaccinated, especially young children. So. May such witness, our witness, in Jesus' name, be leaven in the loaf of our wider society, victimized as as it is, as we are, by violent, coercive powers of all kinds. May our Christian witness, God's work, our hands, continue Christ's power, made perfect in weakness for the healing of the nations. Amen.
Let us come before the triune God in prayer, responding to each petition with the words from today's psalm, show us your mercy. God of salvation, we pray for churches around the world. Sustain those churches that experience persecution or harassment and give wisdom to churches in free societies that we might live according to your word. Hear our prayer, O holy God. God of creation, we pray for your earth. Protect the natural beauty in our national and local parks and forests, and guide the decisions of all who care for and work on the land. Hear our prayer, O omnipotent God. God of righteousness, we pray for the nations. Bestow your peace throughout the world. Raise up prophets to speak truth to power. Uphold those who work for human rights and protect the poor and the refugee. On this 4th of July, we ask that you bless the United States, free us from prejudices, and grant our elected leaders a passion for justice and a will to serve all the people. Protect from danger all those who celebrate this day. Hear our prayer, O sovereign God. God of compassion, we pray for the sick and suffering, for the victims of disasters, for all indigenous people around the globe, for those deprived of their freedom, for those facing the Delta COVID contagion, and for those we name here before you, Sandy Lindemood, Franz Gimler, Joanna Plerpa, Jean Broyhill, Effie Stallsmith, Maggie Mount, Lee Hansen, Malcolm Stark, Norm Olson, Barb Jensen, Charlotte Beck, Lynn Keywell, John Beston, Philip Zwingler, Maria Lusky, Tucker Dean, Irene Belcher, Jacoby, and all of those we name before you now. Hear our prayer, O ever-present God. Show us your mercy. God of faithfulness, we pray for ourselves. Be with each of us on our many journeys and graciously receive our personal petitions. Hear our prayer, O saving God. Show us your mercy. God of eternal love, we thank you for all your saints, those who have served their nation, and those who ministered beyond national boundaries. At the end of all things, bring us all into the kingdom of your presence. Hear our prayer, O glorious God. Show us your mercy. Into your hands, O God, we commend ourselves, our nation, and all for whom we pray, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always.
Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been shown, sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us, Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, given for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
the blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and forever. Amen. Amen.